This evening we are to talk on the subject of the solar symbolism as it relates uh, to the mystery of the Messiah, as this mystery was understood by ancient peoples. In order to get a little background for this theme, we want to go a little further in establishing our great system of astronomical symbolism. <clears throat> About 300 years before the beginning of the Christian era, there lived a man by the name of Eratus. He came from the area of Soli, which is now Cilicia, and it was from this same region, region that St. Paul came. It may therefore be due to this and to the great esteem in which Eratus was held that he is considered today as the only non-Christian writer, uh, non-Jewish uh, writer, to be quoted in the New Testament. The quotation occurs in the 17th chapter of St. Paul. Paul is speaking in Athens at his famous sermon given by the altar of the unknown God. And he says in addressing the Athenians, as your poets have said, referring to God, we are his offspring. This is from the fifth line of the phenomena of Aratus of Soli. Aratus was no astronomer, and yet, weirdly or strangely enough, we regard him today as one of the most important figures in the history of astronomical research. He was a physician, a man of letters, an outstanding poet, and spent uh, the second part of his life, second half, in the court of the king of Macedonia. The king was very much interested in the astronomical researches of a previous scholar, who had left a number of verses and also considerable prose material under the general title, The Appearances. This title meant to imply the appearances of the heavens at different seasons and times. Aratus took the original notes and composed a magnificent poem of about 800 verses. In this poem, he epitomizes for us the astronomical knowledge of his time, a knowledge which was largely observational. But he gives us a number of things to think about, which have endeared him to the memory of the world. First of all, he indicates through his poem very clearly that at this time, his day, the great system of constellational symbols, which we know now, was already thoroughly established. He also tells us in the poem that these symbols had descended to his day from a remote and unknown antiquity. There is a, almost always an association between Eratus and the Greek scholar, statesman, and philosopher Thales. Thales went to Egypt about the 6th century BC and perhaps from the Egyptians learned of the mysteries of the heavens. In any event, he is by legend accredited with the invention of a heavenly sphere, that is a kind of globe, like our terrestrial globe. The outer surface of this sphere studded with stars and connected together to form the outlines of the constellations. So the ancients by the 6th century BC definitely had a spherical concept of the heavens, and they had made a kind of map or chart of all the constellations and the orbits of the planets and most of the other basic astronomical phenomena. The record left by Eratus of Soli 
based upon these earlier writings and traditions, have, have, has made possible the uranographic charts and the system which we now use in representing the phenomena of the sky. So he was a very important man. And he gave us, in his poem, a great number of legends showing the close association in the Greek mind, the Near Eastern mind in general, between these star groupings and the great systems of myths, legends, and fables, which have always formed a part of Greek culture. Uh, Aratus points out that in all probability, the star groups were named for the exploits and for the uh, various deities and the various symbols with which they were associated. As, for example, the wonderful exploit of the Argonautic expedition was preserved in the heavens in the form of the constellation Argo, the ship. Now we also realize that in Greek myths, when a human being achieved a very heroic estate and became uh, more than human, he was in the end frequently picked up and carried into the sky to form a star or a constellation. Several mortals were so honored. This probably merely tells us uh, that the physical or human exploits of the person became part of the astronomical law of the people. Therefore, when we point out certain parallels in symbolism between astronomy and religion, as has been rather clearly set forth by numbers of writers in their astrotheological dissertations, we do not mean to imply that our religion merely began a star worship. Rather, we mean to convey the idea that by degrees we bestowed upon the heavens certain concepts which arose within the human being himself. The heavens were like a vast mirror, sparkling with lights, and man looking into this magic mirror of the sky saw rising before his mental eye strange visions, <coughs> wonderful symbolic patterns. And the more he meditated upon these, uh, the more he filled them in out of his own understanding, until the strange dark mystery of night became indeed a processional of wonderful figures, symbols, and devices. By degrees, man interpreted the lives of deities and of heroes in terms of the sidereal elements and factors. In his study of the heavens, man was immediately impressed by that powerful star which was for him the giver of life. That star is the sun. Men of old did not worship the sun. They represented it, however, as the most appropriate symbol of the eternal source of life and light, seeking for words which failed, for various devices which were inadequate, any means they could imagine by which they could honor the great giver of life. Ancient man could find no emblem more splendid no symbol more appropriate, no device more essentially truthful than this blazing orb of day. So throughout the world, at all ages and times, the sun became associated with religion. <coughs> it was associated because, as the great Pharaoh <coughs> Amenhotep IV pointed out, that the sun is the nourisher, the life giver. It shines upon both the just and the unjust. 
It recognizes no difference in creed or color or race. It is not denied to one people and given to another. The grain of the believer and the unbeliever planted in the earth will sprout with the light of the sun. The sun, therefore, is a universal concept. It belongs to no time. It bears upon itself no strange limiting symbols belonging to one group of culture or another. It is the ever-splendid orb of day. It is that which lift, lifted man from the terror of night. In ancient times, men were afraid of darkness. They huddled in their caves and huts through the long, dark hours of night, fearful of strange animals and of disasters which came to those who wandered about in darkness. But with the rising of the sun, the world of realities was once more revealed. The ghosts retired. The demons were no longer powerful. The spirits of the dead returned to their graves. And just as the story of the crowing of the cock heralded the end of the dance macabre, the strange dance of death, so the dawn, heralded by the Chanticleer, brought with it ever-renewed hope of good times, of happiness, and permitted men to see the faces of each other without doubt or worry. Thus the sun was benevolent. It warmed those that were cold, and while sometimes the tyranny of its rays caused great heat, for the most part in temperate zones where these philosophies were developed, it was a friend, a friend the coming of which promised fertility, the time of planting. It was also the friend that brought the ripening of the harvest. It was also the friend whose departure in winter was a cause of the deepest regret. And the rebirth of this friend at the vernal equinox was the subject of continuous universal rejoicing. So the sun in itself was a wonderful and beautiful emblem to ancient man. Now the Egyptians, looking about them by the side of the Nile, where the sandy banks flowed down to the water, and where there was in good season much mud, which was the life of Egypt, observed a very curious thing. There was a little insect, a beetle, called the Scarabasaka. It was very much like our familiar June bug. But this little beetle was a very industrious little creature. It would lay its eggs in a ball of mud, or perhaps of cattle dung. Then it would push this ball with its hind legs backward, usually up some slight incline. And when it had reached the top of the little incline, the beetle let go of the ball, which rolled to the bottom again. It then went down and rolled the ball up again. Now this might seem to be merely uh, a, a fragment from Dante's Inferno, but actually this little uh, beetle was gradually rounding the shape of the ball. It was taking this rough earth and gradually producing a pellet as perfect as a child's marble. When all was exactly the way the scarabus wanted the ball, it was then able, by this same strange backward motion, to push it along, rolling it on the ground a considerable distance, until it came to the place which the insect had decided was suitable for the incubation of the eggs within the ball. Plutarch says the Egyptians believed that this little beetle actually rolled the ball into the Nile, or, as by symbolism, return the seeds to the water of life. This beetle, therefore, was a very interesting figure to the Egyptian mind, and they could not divorce the idea that this little ball rolled along the ground, 
was very much like the sun being rolled across the sky, that the sun was a kind of a body which contained the seeds of life, and these seeds were rolled up the hill from dawn till noon and rolled down the hill from noon to night, a great arc of the sky. The scarabus then for became known as Kepera, and Kepera is a very interesting word in Egyptian because it has two distinct meanings. It is one of the titles of the sun god, and figures of the deity Ra as Kepera sometimes are shown with the scarab over the head, sometimes uh, the a human figure has the scarab for a head, but it was a definitely a solar symbol. But as a solar symbol, Kepra, if you analyze the word as the Egyptian used it, means the becoming, or to be, or that which is all marvelous and wonderful. By extension, <coughs> transformation, for out of this little ball of mud or dung was born the new living thing. It was the old sun god dying each year and being born again in the mystery of the annual resurrection. In their glyphs, the Egyptians sometimes represented the sun with the beetle in the center. And at some seasons, the beetle's wings were spread in beautiful color. And in other seasons, the wings were folded under the stony shell. Uh, the British Museum has one of the most magnificent scarabs, I suppose, in the world. It is of green basalt, representing the god Kepra. And you all know these little scarabs that we sometimes see in rings and things of that nature. Well, the great one in the British Museum is five feet in length, magnificently carved as the symbol of the deity of the sun. In their practical religion, of course, the uh, Egyptians made use of the scarab for a number of devices. One was to replace the heart in the embalming of the mummy. What is called the heart scarab is usually about three inches in length and was placed in the cavature in the body left by the removal and separate embalming of the heart. This scarab was inscribed on the reverse with lines from the Book of the Dead. These lines were in the form of a prayer asking that the great gods of Amentet should hear the prayer of the heart of the deceased and carry him safely through the mystery of death into the beautiful world of everlastingness. The uh, scarabus was therefore the symbol of the resurrection. It uh, was a creature that seemed to belong to the earth, but it could spread its wings and fly off into the sky. It was an ungainly creature, but beautiful in motion, according to the Egyptian concept, forever rolling its little ball back to the sacred Nile. Thus this became a very important solar emblem, and the great ship of the sun is shown supported by the claws of Kepera, the scarab. And the pharaohs wore this device as the symbol of their spiritual and temporal authority. Now we have a sun symbol, the scarab, representing not only the orb in the sky, but everlastingness, the res resurrection of the dead, the restoration of the soul, the purification of those who passed into the other life. Therefore, the scarabus was him as the symbol of the God who preserves, the God who is ever mindful, the God who lifts all things from darkness into light. By this same type of parallel, the sun itself gradually came to be not only an emblem of life, 
in the sense of the great generic quality of existence. It became the symbol of the restoration of life. It became the symbol of hope, of the restoration of all things that were dark and mysterious. As it rose in all its glory, it was the victory of, ignor of wisdom over ignorance, of soul over body, of good over evil, of truth over error. In fact, it was the symbol of the total resurrection of the perfect world represented by and personified by the great God of the Sun himself. In Egypt also, the Sun had many symbols. And in uh, the wonderful hymn to the Sovereign Sun, the Emperor Julian describes one of the most famous of the figures of the Sun in the later religion of Egypt. This was Asarapi, whom we know as Serapis, the great divinity, the guardian of the Alexandrian libraries. And we have some record from early time as to the nature and appearance of this deity. The Serapium, which was his house in Alexandria, North Africa, was a splendid building with a high domed center and with extensions like the transepts of a church moving outward. And this place was filled with books, the great records, the recordings and reports of men from the earliest times, books upon stone and clay, books upon papyrus and other strange materials, originally some of wood and metal, and a little later, some upon the skins of animals. Over this great library, which was said to have contained more than 400,000 pieces of recorded material, presided the wonderful symbolic figure of the Alexandrian Serapis. We do not know too much about the origin and meaning of the word. Serapis was not originally an Egyptian deity. It is quite possible that he came from Asia Minor. In any event, some temples and records about him have been discovered in Syria and the Lebanon. In any uh, explanation, however, he came to Egypt and became one of the principal deities of the great Greek dynasty of Pharaohs, the Ptolemies. Here in Egypt he found congenial resting place and a beautiful figure of him on a magnificent throned pedestal stood in the center of the library. The head of Serapis was a strange and noble one. Long hair hung upon his shoulders and a forked beard. Most remarkable were his eyes, which the ancients describe in detail. With all the majesty of this person, the eyes were those of a man of unutterable sadness, a strange brooding face. And as one old writer said, that as you stood and looked at it, you could almost see tears springing up in its eyes. It was called the weeping God. And yet it stood in all this learning with this strange and incredible sadness. The sadness as though it looked out with infinite solicitude upon a world of suffering. The robed figure of the deity uh, was mysterious also, for some believe that it was an androgynous being. Certainly it was not intended to represent the muscular or heroic type, but the strange, sad, slender scholarship that went with the sadness of the face. Serapis bore upon his head a basket filled with living grain and all the symbols of growth. In one hand he held an instrument resembling a ruler or measuring stick, which was used to estimate the inundation of the Nile, so vital to the survival of the people. Beside him he supported with his other hand a strange 
staff consisted of consisting of the bodies of three serpents twisted together and these three serpents each had a different head one of the heads was that of a wolf another was the head of a lion and the third presumably was the head of a bird the wolf was called the head of the past the lion of the present and the bird of the future. And thus time was twisted together into a strange uh, staff which was used to support the mysterious figure of the deity. Serapis ruled his world and uh, the meaning of his name perhaps from Asur, a form of the word Osiris. Asurapi could be the bull of Osiris, the Hapi or Api being a form of Apis. There is, however, another derivation, namely that it came from a word seraph, meaning to shine, the glorious. And we find the word in the Old Testament, in the Bible, also in the New Testament, as a symbol of the order or hierarchy of the seraphim, meaning the shiners or the glistening ones. In any event, he was a shiner because around the head of this sad, mysterious person was a magnificent aureole of sunburst rays. He was a solar deity. He was the sad, dying son of autumn the son who descends into the underworld and knows the experience of death. When the time came and the great library was sacked during the period of Theodosius, a mob broke into the Serapium. For some time it remained, the mob remained at a distance, um, almost unable to approach the figure. They were frightened. They were awed by it. But mobs and panics have no respect for persons or for gods. And finally they attacked the statue, tore it down, demolished it, broke the pedestal upon which it stood, and finally burned the entire library. When the ashes were cold, and men began to search for the remnants and remains of their own vandalism, the uh, church historian Socrates, not the Greek philosopher, the church historian, says that under the pedestal of Serapis, when they excavated after the destruction of the building, was found the monogram of Christ. Well, this is peculiar because that pedestal stood there and was placed there long before the beginning of the Christian era. But in any event... Uh, that Serapis was a solar divinity, we know. That this divinity was also regarded with some favor by the early Christians, we also know. For we are told by Clement of Alexandria, the Antinicene father, that when the bishops of the, of the church went to Alexandria, they held their services first in the temple of Serapis and afterwards in the church of the Christian sect. This deity, therefore, is another strange and wonderful link with the great mystery of the solar god. 